It's the real news. I'm Aaron Mante. Progressive Democrats are winning races in primaries across the country, and people are paying attention. Here, for example, is Fox News. Bernie Sanders on who he wants to see holding the Democratic flag come November. And in a number of cases, he's getting his way with far left candidates winning primaries over the more centrist establishment choices. The next primary is Tuesday, June 5th in California, which some call ground zero for the fight between progressive Democrats and more establishment types backed by the party leadership in Washington, D.C. And California is key for the Democrats to retake the House in November. There are 23 districts across the country where Republican Congress members hold seats that Hillary Clinton won in 2016. Seven of those districts are in California, making its primary a high stakes race for what kind of candidates will help decide control of Congress. Joining me is David Dayan, author of the book Chain of Title. He is also a Goodman Fellow at In These Times Magazine and a contributor to The Intercept and The New Republic. Welcome, David. Uh, a lot of talk about in California, high stakes, as I said, adding to the uh, magnitude of this race on Tuesday and the stakes is the fact that you have a very bizarre primary system where the top two candidates of any party are selected, meaning that for Democrats, you're going to have some races where it's possible that no Democrats end up advancing to the general election. Can you explain? Yes, uh, that, that's exactly as you say. When you get your ballot in California, every candidate who's running, whether they're Democratic, Republican, Green, Peace and Freedom, Libertarian, Decline to State, all of them appear on your ballot, no matter what party you're from, and you can vote for any one of them. And then the top two of that advance to the general election. This was a, a change to the primary structure that was made in 2010 to solve a budget fight, actually. There was a moderate Republican who uh, wanted to you know, have an opportunity to win Republican primaries, and he, he forced this top two system. And uh, it's causing quite a lot of chaos uh, especially in these races down in Orange County that are these targeted seats from the House where you have a lot of first-time candidates who have a lot of money but not a lot of name recognition. And there are so many Democrats in some of these races and maybe only two viable Republicans that it's very plausible, in three seats in particular, that two Republicans could move to the general election and have no opportunity for Democrats uh, to, to win that seat at all. Right. Uh, your latest piece for The Intercept uh, focuses on those three districts, the 39th, the, uh, the 48th, and the 49th. And you start the piece by talking about a Democratic candidate whose entire campaign, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, is funded by himself. That's right. Uh, this is a guy named uh, Dr. Herbert Lee, who sort of came out of nowhere and just dropped $800,000 on his campaign. He's done nothing else but spend money. And I looked at those three races, and among the 14 active candidates on the Democratic side, there's been $23 million raised, which sounds like a lot of money. However, 16 million of that came from the own pockets of those candidates. Two thirds of the funding is self-funded. And uh, self-funded candidates, historically don't do very well because they usually are neophytes who, who have no understanding of how to attract voters uh, in a big way. They, they throw their money away on consultants and mail and advertising. And uh, they don't necessarily connect because they don't have to look for uh, public support to get low dollar donations. And so it's a symptom of the problem that I think Democrats are facing in Orange County where there aren't really uh, a whole lot of options for them since Orange County is kind of newly open to Democrats. And uh, a lot of these rich candidates who were prompted by the DCCC, the, the, the House campaign arm for Democrats, who, who really likes these self-funded candidates because then they don't have to throw money at, at, at the problem themselves. Uh, but it's sort of created a monster here in California. Well, can you explain that further? This is a phenomenon that uh, you and your colleagues at The Intercept have been covering, where you have uh, progressive candidates across the country trying to get involved, getting, you know, uh, raising money, collecting volunteers. But then you have the party leadership coming in and saying, we don't want you to run uh, because we favor the person who can actually fundraise for themselves. Right. 
And, and so you combine that with this top two, which uh, in the minds of Democrats creates this desire to winnow the field so you don't have this shot of missing out in November, uh, you end up with a lot of rich candidates who have, have they, they can't be sort of bu bullied around by the national party. So you have millionaires who can self-fund, uh, the uh, candidates like you're talking about, progressives who are trying to build sort of a coalition of support, can't compete financially with these guys. And there's no way to win in the field because if you, uh, you know, if the party picks one of these millionaires and says, okay, we're backing this guy, the, the other millionaires say, all right, I'm going to throw down another million dollars and I'm not getting out of this race. And that's what you're seeing in the 39th, 48th and 49th where you have multiple candidates spending millions and millions of dollars and the party sort of unable to separate uh, the wheat from the chaff. And you have all this infighting going on, a lot of uh, uh, intra-party arguments. And meanwhile, on the other side, the Republican candidates have, have electoral experience by and large. And uh, uh, you know the way that things are looking, there's definitely an opportunity that you're gonna get two Republicans uh, advancing to the general election in some of these races. Hmm. Let's talk about the uh, Senate primary uh, for the seat uh, held by Diane Feinstein. She is running again, but uh, she's faced some strong resistance this time. Uh, back in February, the state party declined to endorse her. Uh, she has many challengers, including uh, state Senate member Kevin DeLeon. Is she in trouble? Well, uh, you know, Feinstein has has been representing uh, California since 1992 in Congress, and she'll, uh, uh, I think, be 85 years old at the end of uh, uh, this campaign. So uh, there is this, you know, it's well documented that she is at odds with some of the more progressive uh, 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 constituents here in California. And uh, State Senate leader Kevin DeLeon is definitely running to her left. Uh, he is he is trying to amass support both from labor, which has actually endorsed him over Feinstein, uh, and from progressives. Um, he, you know, it's a tough state to really gain a lot of traction if you're not super well known, like a Diane Feinstein. I mean, uh, the population of California is is 39 million people. It's like running for president of Canada uh, to run statewide or president of Iraq. Uh, th those are the comparable uh, uh, populations. And so it's going to be difficult for Kevin DeLeon. However, he's, he's likely to make the top two. It's likely to be a Feinstein DeLeon general election. And that gives DeLeon five more months to introduce himself to the public in California and, and try to get more people uh, interested in this campaign. I think there's got to be some tipping point where he becomes viable sort of in the eyes of the electorate. Uh, and, and we'll see if that happens and if he'll have the money, frankly, to compete because uh, Feinstein's backers have, have almost been blackballing uh, donors uh, who, who want to uh, give to De Leon's campaign. There's, a, there's an under the radar thing going on that's denying De Leon the kind of fundraising support that he's had in the state legislature. Uh, and so that's going to be difficult for him to overcome. What are they doing? Uh, they're basically telling donors if, if you donate to Kevin DeLeon that we're, you're, you're, you're not going to get anything. Uh, you'll never get your access to not only Feinstein, but all the sort of uh, establishment figures that, that, finds, that are backing Feinstein. People like Garcetti, uh, the mayor of Los Angeles, people like Kamala Harris, the other senator from California. Uh, there, there's definitely a campaign to keep the money out of De Leon's pocket. And uh, really, his, his best shot is if the labor community really comes forward strongly. And that's weirdly dependent on the governor's race uh, 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 for, for bizarre reasons, because Antonio Villaraigosa, who is a Democrat running for governor, uh, is strongly backed by uh, charter school interests. And if he gets into the top two against Gavin Newsom, it's likely labor will spend a lot of money in the governor's race. If Gavin Newsom goes to the general election against a Republican, he's likely safe to win that seat and it frees up money for labor, perhaps to spend on Delia. So in the wackiness of this top two primary, 
uh, who wins the primary on the governor's seat uh, might have a bearing on what happens in the Senate race. Finally, David, in terms of this uh, struggle for the Democratic Party's identity, um, pitting the Bernie Sanders style progressives versus uh, more centrist candidates, in your reporting, the candidates you've covered at the conventions where we've seen some acrimonious fights, how have you seen that identity battle play out? Well, we're seeing it play out all over the country. The Intercept has been reporting on this. Some uh, races have been uh, won by the more progressive elements. Some have been won by the establishment. Uh, here in California, kind of a bellwether race for that is actually the 45th congressional district. Uh, Katie Porter, who is the only mem uh, uh, congressional candidate that's backed by Elizabeth Warren. Uh, she was a former student of Elizabeth Warren's and she's a law professor at, at UC Irvine. She's the progressive candidate in the race. She's running against a guy, Dave Min, who is also a professor at UC Irvine, uh, but he is backed by the new Democrats, who are the more centrist Democrats in Congress. And uh, he was also backed by the state party, the California Democratic Party, uh, at the convention in a very contentious battle. He won by one vote at the convention. And so what happens in that Porter versus Min race uh, and, and that's a race where they're going to go up against Mimi Walters, who is the incumbent Republican down in Orange County around Irvine. Uh, that's sort of the bellwether in terms of this struggle for the soul of the Democratic Party or what have you. Uh, that will be an interesting race to watch on Tuesday. David Dayan, author of the book Chain of Title, a Goodman Fellow at In These Times magazine, and a contributor to The Intercept and The New Republic. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.